Okay, so good afternoon, everyone, um, and um, good morning, Jens. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, it's my pleasure today uh, to introduce a special seminar because, I mean, we had two talks for the price of one previously um, in one session. Today, we may be getting to audience for the price of one because this seminar is both um, uh, the, the regular greater seminar that we have every other week, but it's also open today for the computer science group at the um, University of Leicester, which is part of the, the, the school I'm in. So, um, so we may have a few more people here that are not normally uh, attending these meetings. Uh, Jens is aware of that, don't worry. Um, and and, and uh, he promised us to do a little bit of motivation that maybe wouldn't otherwise be necessary. Um, but before we go there, let me just say that that uh, uh, sort of Jens is probably one of my, old, my, my, my oldest friends and colleagues if I, if, I, if, I, if I go back because we I think we, we met sort of around uh, uh, 2000 or even earlier than that uh, uh, in, in, in Paderborn where we were both colleagues working there at the same university, same department um, and then he went off to Canada uh, after uh, a couple of years and a couple of years later I went to 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 um, to the UK as, as as you probably know, um, and we've been in touch sort of casually ever since, but not 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 really very deeply. Um, so I'm happy that uh, sort of um, to, to, I was happy to meet him at, at ICGT, for example, this year even even virtually, and 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 now he's presenting some of the work that he's um, reported on there, um, and maybe some future and 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 um, further developments of that. Um, and uh, yeah, so, 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 so he's joined us from a long way away. And that's, that's why I said good morning earlier because it's sort of six o'clock for him. So, so please um, be friendly and <laughs> forgive any slight uh, uh, <laughs> um, oversights. But I'm sure he's, he's had a couple of coffees. So I think he should be okay now. Um, so he's a professor at uh, the University of um, Victoria in British Columbia, which is, as we have established, uh, the island that looks small on the map uh, on the on the other side of Canada, so quite far away, but it's actually quite a big island. And um, um, the good news is he hasn't been flooded uh, personally, as many of the other people have in that in that kind of area. So so we should be okay. So um, yeah, sorry for the long speech, Jens. Please go ahead. Well, that's great. Thanks very much, uh, Reiko, for that uh, nice introduction and. Yeah, thanks to, to Nick and all the organizers of the Greater Seminar uh, for the invitation. Uh, that's, um, that's great. Now, um, I have been uh, in Victoria uh, in uh, Canada for some time and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great place. And I do want to acknowledge with respect the Likwangan peoples on whose traditional territory this university stands and the Sanjis, Esquimalt, and Washanic peoples whose historical relationship with this land continues to this day. So I'm, I'm blessed to be living and playing and working here on this, uh, on this uh, territory. So um, just for reference, uh, you see here on the slide that my former last name is Janke. So some of these Early applications that I'm going to talk about, if you look up some of the papers, uh, you, you won't find the, the Weber. Uh, that's my, my wife's name, uh, which I adopted later on, actually, after I think five years uh, after we married. It's just easier, I find, in Canada to be a Weber when you order a table in a restaurant. <laughs> there you go. So, okay. Uh, so let's let's go into this. Uh, I, I want to start by talking a little bit about the type of applications, the type of work that we do in our lab here. Because uh, since I moved to Canada, uh, maybe after, uh, for the last 15, 17 years, I've been working on applications primarily in, in health information systems. Not exclusively, absolutely, but um, it explains a little bit why we're looking at graph transformations when we do software engineering work in this area, because we're very interested in assurance, uh, assurance when it comes to, for example, processing of information, um, not losing any information, uh, doing it in a predictable way and so on. 
And I, uh, we have this interdisciplinary lab, lab here, which is, you could say, uh, partially within University of Victoria engineering and software engineering and partially within UBC medicine. And my lab co-director is Morgan Price, um, who is um, in this department of family practice at UBC. And I have an adjunct appointment there too. So what I want to do is I want to start by just talking about a few of these applications that we have worked on in the past, and some of them go back quite some time. I mean, uh, and even before we looked at health information systems specifically, but even as early on as uh, when I met Raiko first at, at uh, in Paderborn, um, Albert Zundorf and I were working on um, re-engineering of information systems. And the idea there was to take uh, legacy information systems and not just the database schema, but the entire information system and re-engineering into some more modern object-oriented platforms. And again, transformations were important there. It, uh, it would take uh, the uh, schema and uh, the code of the legacy information system into a graph structure and then map it into uh, a re-engineered graph structure, which then would uh, be used for implementing an object-oriented interface to that legacy system. Uh, so uh, for these applications, we used uh, products, tools that were available at that time for graph transformations, for building them, in particular, uh, in this case, the progress environment that was uh, uh, generated uh, at the University of Aachen. Um, by Zundorf, Schur, and others. And uh, we found, uh, uh, when we looked at applying this, that uh, it was great for prototyping. Uh, it also was great because um, it had persistence of the, the, uh, the models. There was a graph database underneath. Uh, there was uh, uh, initially some scalability problems, but uh, with only having uh, 64,000 nodes, I think, in, uh, but the later version of Progress actually uh, got rid of that. But we also found, building these, that uh, the weight of the tool in terms of all the uh, installations that you would have to put in place and using that uh, and the learning curve, uh, usability of the tool was, was quite heavy. Uh, then when we tried to integrate the tool, the prototype that we have built with uh, other uh, systems, the interoperability with other software here uh, was also quite challenging. So, so I, I call this the runtime interoperability here, so a minus here. And then the integration of that software with the software development lifecycle, things like versioning, things uh, uh, such as um, yeah, uh, checking this into Git, maybe, um, certifying or code signing that the integrity of the code is, is undisturbed, uh, that was um, not working well. It was a very close tool. So then um, later uh, we worked on health information messaging. So here's another application. In, in health information systems, you have interoperability requirements, obviously, because they're different health information systems by different vendors. And there is a standard called HL7, health level seven, where messages need to be developed in a certain transformative way, starting with a reference information model, doing transformations into a domain information model with further in-place transformations, and then transforming this into a message information model, and then in uh, the actual um, hierarchical messages um, that are um, exchanged in XML. And we've, again, used graph transformation tools um, to build tools for this because the standard HL7 didn't really have tools for that. And the, again, the assurance um, and the abstraction that you get from using graph transformations was sought after. So for that, we used Fujiaba, uh, which was developed by Nira Zundorf and colleagues, uh, which is a, a Java-based tool. And I have my little scorecard here again. Uh, again, great for prototyping. Uh, it didn't have any 
persistence or transactions. So these um, graphs were in main memory only. There was a, well, you could store them in a, in a file, but there were some problems with that. Um, we found um, scalability so so, um, essentially how much memory you can put into your um, computer. Tooling weight was better in, in a sense that it didn't have all these uh, infrastructure requirements, like maybe like progress and running on Solaris, a particular version of the operating system, runs on Java, fine. Um, it was also, since it's running on Java, some um, better scores on the runtime interoperability, but the integration with the software development lifecycle was a problem still. Now then later, um, we worked on, for example, the, uh, what well, we called this the smart pill bottle project, but uh, we had, uh, there's several devices nowadays available to source information in this connected health space on uh, taking your medications. When patients take medications, there's a small pill, smart pill bottle here in the middle here, it records when you take it. So the idea was in this connected health space to track adherence to prescriptions. And again, uh, formalizing that with graph transformations uh, was our idea of uh, doing that. And we've built a system there, which was also uh, pu published uh, about in ICGT 2015. And we used Groove uh, by Rensic, Rensic and uh, colleagues, another graph transformation tool for that purpose. Groove is also Java based. And uh, yeah, uh, it was great for prototyping. Uh, it didn't have uh, transactions and uh, persistence in terms of a database, but um, scalability and tooling weight was fairly good, but it didn't have very good runtime interoperability. Um, there was essentially a way to, to communicate with it, but was mainly undocumented interfaces and yeah, um, very limited integration of what you develop with these tools with the software development lifecycle. And then the last application, and I'm using this all as to motivate great press, uh, great press as you will probably be able to tell um, that I want to talk about here briefly is also in the health informatics space. And here we have um, an integration of a concrete electronic medical record software system, OSCA, which is the open source clinical application resource. So that's a medical record system with one of these messaging standards in a large scale information exchange network of medical records. And here we wanted to use graph transformations again for these transformations between the interoperability standard and the internal OSCA data model. And uh, we looked at tools that would actually allow us to specify these graph transformations and also then actually execute them given that OSCA has a existing object model, which is, um, well, a plain, plain old object Java object model, patient model. And, um, and the um, interoperability format would come in as a um, uh, XML document in this HL7 uh, E2E e standard, which is the EMR to EMR interchange standard. And there is a library from HL7, or actually from an organization that implements libraries here, uh, called Everest. And we did not find any tool that would allow us to do that. Um, the tools would not interface easily with these object models. So ultimately what we ended up doing is we specified the graph transformation rules with Visio, and then we implemented them essentially uh, as best as we could. Uh, this is also in a, a uh, publication at ICMT 2017. Uh, so on, on those tools, uh, um, not very good for prototyping. Um, didn't get persistence and scalability out of these tools, but the tool weight was great because uh, Visio is um, easy to use <laughs> and install. <laughs> um, 
yeah, and we didn't have any runtime interoperability and uh, integration with the software development lifecycle. So, um, meanwhile, in the model transformation community, uh, there have been quite a bit of um, rumblings around using internal DSLs, domain specific languages, for model transformations. And here's one paper that discusses this in a, um, I find, um, very systematic manner. But there's been other works on this before. Uh, and the idea is that if you have internal domain specific languages, then they inherit a lot of the tool support and uh, modularity um, interoperability from the host languages. And there, there have been uh, yeah, graph transformation uh, libraries like SDMlib, FooLib, um, FunnyQt, um, and others that pursued that idea. Excuse me, Jens. Can you can you just say what you mean by internal, or what they mean by internal? Oh, so so a, a domain specific language that's internal to um, a host language essentially uses the host language for formulating um, well. Then, for example, graph transformation rules, right? So you could have a um, domain specific language. Uh, let's say, um, yeah. Uh, that, that you just make up, um, right? And it's it's not it's not written then. So, for example, if you if you have Java and you write uh, graph transformation uh, uh, graph transformations like an SDM lib as in form of Java code, but in a certain st structured way, right? That's that's an internal DSL. Yeah. But it's, but it's not the same as a library, right? So you have specific additional syntactic features in there. Uh, with uh, sort of extending extending the base language, so that uh, usually um, internal DSLs are heavily library based. Ultimately, I mean, if yeah. you if you use, for example, a, a particular styles of um, writing uh, this code, for example, the, there's a fluent style uh, of writing Java code. Then ultimately, you're using, for example, Java. Um, using Java syntax, but you're expressing it in a way that reads very much like a um, uh, domain-specific graph transformation language. But it is it is not making up new syntax if you have an okay. internal DSL. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Because then you inherit the, a lot of the tooling around, for example, syntactical checks and and uh, mm -hmm. maybe processing mm -hmm. on this. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Welcome. Anytime. So, yeah, any other questions? No, okay. So in this paper by Hinkle and our colleagues, they made uh, several observations, but uh, I picked some of them out. Um, so they, they observed that if you're doing, if you do this model transformation, they were focusing on model transformation language, but you know, same for graph transformation languages. As an internal DSL that that yields a lot of advantages, leveraging the tools uh, operating on the host language. So you have editors, versioning, integrity, code signing, modularization, and all of that you inherit. They also point out that, um, in their opinion, it yields no advantages with respect to leveraging runtime tooling for the host languages. And they also say, well, it inherits the limitations of the host language. So the syntax. Um, limits you, so you have to, for example, then write in a textual syntax your graph transformations, which may or may not be what you want. So I, I put a couple of smileys here, how, how I feel about these, <laughs> right? Uh, but then I'm thinking, okay, well, are these limitations generally true? And what about dynamic host languages? So dynamic languages or languages that um, uh, uh, essentially if you will merge or fuse more of this uh, editing uh, and, and execution. Um, so runtime and if you will static. And then when it comes to syntax limitations, what about dynamically generating other syntaxes that are outside the host language? Thinking about potentially internal hybrid DSLs. And if that's not clear, let's look at the next slides. 
because that is some earlier work I did uh, on GRAPE. That was a paper uh, on uh, in ICGT on 2017, where GRAPE is this graph transformation language internal DSL, which in this case was for closure, not for Java, but it's a JVM language. And if you don't really understand uh, closure so much, that's not a, not a big deal. But first of all, I want to point out that uh, the idea here was to create a hybrid DSL that isn't limited necessarily by just the syntax of the host language. See, while you write your graph transformation rules in a textual notation, you automatically then get inlined a picture uh, of the graph transformation rule that shows you, it's a read-only picture, right? But it, it shows you the graph transformation rule in, in a visual way. That's not your input, but it is a read-only output. And if you're using appropriate tools, like in this case, as a light table IDE, the dynamic language, as soon as you type this, this rule here into uh, the editor, it will automatically show you that picture in line. So it's not something that you have to add. So I call that a hybrid DSL with read-only syntax. Um, and uh, what, what this tool Grape also supported was to uh, house these graphs for the graph transformations in a graph database for scalability and um, other advantages that the transactions that the database provides us with. So here this graph transformation rule um, uses the uh, uh, compact syntax for, um, I'll talk a bit more about syntax later on, but uh, for those um, who maybe joined here who are not so familiar with graph transformations, the rule ultimately, the way how the, the syntax here was uh, chosen is that a rule ultimately reads a certain pattern uh, in a host graph and then it may uh, delete some graph elements and it may add some graph elements. So it's, it's an operational uh, definition. So here we read mm -hmm. um, a pattern that has two nodes uh, and it has an edge here that, that edge is later deleted and we are adding, that's the green stuff here, um, yeah, a node contract and two edges to, uh, to what's preserved. So um, gave it a scorecard too, <laughs> this, uh, this grape engine. Um, we used it on several projects. We found it, um, it's great for prototyping. It uh, has the persistence in the transactions and scalability due to the database. Um, the tooling weight was so-so, it was, was not bad. I mean, you still had to uh, install then, uh, yeah, uh, the database, make that available, closure and so on. Uh, runtime interrupt, great. I mean, Closure is the JVM language. You can uh, run, com, um, connect to anything JVM and a perfect um, software development lifecycle integration because ultimately it's, it's just Closure code and uh, you could just um, uh, use any uh, yeah, Git versioning, um, code integrity tools, everything that you would normally use. Then, um, well, we thought some further about um, could it be possible to, to have even zero installation tooling or um, uh, address this tooling weight? And what about participatory prototyping? What I mean by that is, again, coming back to the type of work that we do in the lab. Um, when I work with Morgan, for example, on uh, brainstorming of how we can score drug adherence or writing some transformations that um, intersect with the domain knowledge of the, the healthcare folks. Um, I'd, I'd like to have a bit more, a, a tool that allows me to, to discuss a bit more collaboratively and explain a bit more these rules. So I'd, I'd like to have a lot more of a documentation type tool. So now we're finally arriving at the motivation of great press. Um, Cause computational notebooks have seen quite an emergence. Uh, um, and the pioneers here have been um, uh, Wolfram, 
Um, and um, yeah, if you go to the Wolfram website, there is a definition that defines computational notebooks as the primary medium for modern technical communication and innovation, mixing text, graphics, and live code to express ideas in a convenient and accurate way. Yeah. So that's what I want. And uh, yeah, with uh, seen or maybe you haven't seen, then ch check out uh, for a demonstration uh, Stephen Wolfram's uh, great Greta talk about, uh, I mean, it's essentially giving the entire presentation based on notebooks, <laughs> I think. Uh, and it's a great uh, presentation. I would have liked to do that too. I'm home at home right now, but some job don't have this running <laughs> right now, and I'm actually don't dare, but <laughs> honestly, no. But um, I mean, we use computational notebooks nowadays in many places. We teach uh, at the university uh, many of our courses, um, Python or, or data science courses and so on. They use um, Jupyter. Uh, other notebooks are used and popular nowadays as well. So I thought that, that would be great. And, and they're often browser-based, so they can be just used, zero installation, just go to that site and um, you know, off you go. So the, the value proposition really of the computational notebooks is that, um, yeah, they integrates the note taking and the documentation with interactive exploration and, and they make your ex experiments repeatable and support collaboration, low threshold of entry uh, and then many different applications. So I'd like that. And I want a computational notebook for graph transformations. Uh, and uh, that's uh, yeah, what Raiko referred to um, the ICGT uh, 21 publication is about that um, grape press tool. So I had to find a notebook platform for grape. Uh, several would uh, qualify there. I've chosen Gorilla, which is open source uh, by Johnny Hudson and contributors. Uh, there's also a, a fork, a pink gorilla. Uh, there is now also a Jupyter version for closure, closed Jupyter. I think that wasn't there when I started working on this. So I've, I've chosen the uh, gorilla um, platform. So here's how this looks like for GrayPress, for this computation notebook that we developed here. So we have ultimately in a notebook, multiple sheets, worksheets, they can be arbitrarily long. And uh, then we have static elements. Uh, they can be written in Markdown or extended Markdown. See I mean, Markdown nowadays, extensions have um, diagramming tools and all of that. But ultimately a static segment is something that isn't um, executed. Then you have dynamic segments uh, that have a code fragment and a rendering of the result. And here we have a very, very simple you know, graph transformation rule. Ultimately, it's just a, it's not a transformation rule. Ultimately, it's just reading a node um, of type person. So it's graph test if you really um, want, right? And then you, you can, um, after you've defined this, you can actually call that rule uh, just to find person. And in this case, because the graph doesn't really have a node of type person, so it says false. So um, before we'll look at some example notebook here for this talk, um, I just want to give you a brief overview of the grape language, this graph transformation language, the, uh, the elements in there. And then uh, we'll talk more about some of these language features. So the graphs that are supported by Grape are directed, attributed, node, and edge-labeled graphs. Ultimately, um, that is supported um, by the, the graph database as well. You can have rules that support single pushout and double pushout uh, semantics. So what that means for, for folks who are not so familiar with this, ultimately, for what that means for me um, is that um, uh, when you replace ultimately um, a notes and you, you delete a note, for example, uh, and it, there are dangling edges after deletion, um, that's not possible if you if you use a DPO uh, semantics. So you, you have to have a um, 
uh, replacement that um, also replaces or deletes all the embedding context there. I'll talk more about that in, in a bit. We have application conditions and negative application conditions. Uh, we have path expressions, um, optional graph elements, something called merged graph elements, and I'll talk more about this. Ultimately, what this is, is um, creating graph elements only if they uh, not already exist. We have complex transactions with non-deterministic control structures and also a choice between isomorphic and homomorphic matching of the, um, uh, the left-hand side of the rules. And grape is schema-less, so you don't have to define a schema, but it supports schema constraints. So you can define them. So before I, I talk more about these language concepts, I, I just want to give um, a little bit of an example um, worksheet, so work at an example. And this is an example application, again, that deals with the uh, notion of adherence or prescriptions. Actually, it's not really adherence, but it's uh, drug prescriptions. There's a, a currently an ongoing project on um, the safety of multiple prescriptions. So a lot of uh, uh, seniors may actually be on six or more prescriptions. Those may come from different prescribers. And the question is how to formalize these prescriptions into uh, a formal structure and then check for temporal conflicts. There are quite a few systems nowadays, uh, health information systems that check for drug-drug interactions um, just in terms of the substances. But when it comes to the temporal aspects of when to use these prescriptions, how far they should be apart or together and so on, um, um, there's there's not automated systems that do these nowadays. Yeah, and uh, the worksheet and some more information about this project is here on the good GitHub page. And CHAOS is actually uh, so maybe a little bit of a bad name for it, but it stands for Collaborative Health um, Adherence Optimization System or something like that. Yeah. All right, so here's an example worksheet or starting point of a worksheet here. Uh, it starts with static elements. So it's, it's like a document um, you can describe and uh, all of that is in Markdown. And even and this diagram here is actually Markdown. If you click on it, it's actually a textual uh, diagram. Uh, you can define your, your diagram. Some of you have seen these textual languages. You can define uh, UML diagrams. Here's a graph um, schema that's defined here, but it's really just as a static element. and yeah, it's not so important to really understand uh, exactly the uh, the application graph structure, but I'll just um, describe it a little bit hand wavy. So we have a little bit of a textual input language for testing. Um, so textually you can uh, input prescriptions in our system like uh, require A1, which is maybe a drug for 10 weeks, every second day administer one or one to two and restrict taking A, three and A4 apart by at least four hours. So you can have a set of prescriptions like that. Uh, they can be modeled in, well, um, what we currently call a relative temporal frame model, which is a graph model that has restrict and require statements and frames and subframes. These frames can be days and weeks and nights and mornings and minutes and, uh, and so on. And um, yeah, then the, the worksheet goes on uh, and here we see some dynamic elements. So we have, uh, for example, here, uh, these, these use statements are just closure statements that we have a little bit of a parser that can parse this textual representation. Uh, we have another worksheet actually that just defines just very simple graph transformations to build up that RTF graph, which we're just importing here. So you can import another worksheet just as normal. These worksheets are just stored as normal closure programs, or closure, closure uh, modules. And then you can call the, uh, the parse on a prescription statement. Uh, and uh, in the uh, computational notebook, just called Browse, which is built into GradePress, and then it shows you the graph. So you can experiment with that. You can see, okay, this is how uh, this prescription looks like in this RTF graph. 
So this is a bird's eye view. So I'll, I'll zoom in for this. If you can't, if you have the squint right now, um, uh, I'll, I'll zoom in. I just want to give you the uh, the overview first. So this is uh, the this section of the worksheet that talks about how we plan, Morgan and I and, and collaborators, um, a plan to transform this RTF graph into an STN and a simple temporal network. Simple, simple temporal networks are formal graph structures again uh, for modeling uh, simple temporal problems and then doing analysis on them. And again, the details of this is not, not so important really to understand, but we have uh, this, decided to use six steps to do this. Um, transformation, we're unrolling the durations, um, these top level frames into, it's like unrolling a loop, uh, I guess if you're familiar with that, into uh, multiple iterations. We're splitting these subframes, unrolling our frames, we're connecting subframes, and then we filter iterations. So iterations are these statements like take every second day, uh, and uh, then we're creating um, time points. So these are the ultimately the elements of um, the simple temporal network. So again, I, it's it's more of an illustration on how to use a worksheet for exploration and prototyping. Okay, so um, here's the rule um, that does the unroll duration uh, transformations. Um, so this, the syntax maybe here is not so important. I am, again, we have a um, we read and uh, we read something from the graph and we create something, but we can maybe point out at this graphical syntax more what the rule does and some. More important than even what the rule does is some of the concepts that we see here. So we're looking for uh, a require and a frame node, and there's a path expression here. So path expression goes uh, through a um, sub edge and um, one or many next edges. So there's a syntax for this. Uh, there is a negative application condition. There is a positive application condition. Um, and there is a, a new node and edges produced here. Now, and we'll see, um, I'll, I'll go into the syntax a bit more, and it's really not so important to, to understand that rule and detail for this application. Yeah, and then we can apply this, this rule uh, directly in the, in the worksheet. Uh, here we apply it as often as we can while unroll duration. Um, so and when you apply the rule, graph transformation rule, it, it delivers true or false. And so you can just use a normal closure while loop to apply it. And I wrote down in the worksheet, this is also in the worksheet, let's look at the result of unruling. Uh, so of course, those of you who are very familiar with graph transformation say, Jens, um, it's not the result. So who tells you that this is all confluent and uh, you know it could be one possible result because <laughs> it's non-deterministic what you're matching. And that's true. So I screwed up with this worksheet here, uh, but uh, for Morgan, it was good enough because I was actually able to, to just squint it and say, okay, there's only one solution if you actually look at this. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, that's, that's true. So um, some of these, and I'll conclude at the end, uh, some of these re theoretical results from the graph transformation arena about verification, static analysis of these rules, um, confluence in particular, and Lean has given a great presentation and Fernando on this in this uh, seminar series. Um, that's something on the to-do list for <laughs> putting into this tool. Right now, you just have to squint at it and, and think about whether that's deterministic. Okay, so then uh, I'll just show uh, one more uh, from th from this worksheet example, one more rule, the split subframe rule here. Um, so maybe just as an example, will we specify here in the input language that this is an iso must be an isomorphic match, which means that since uh, we we have here um, a match of two nodes of type frame, they need to match to different nodes. Uh, they can't in the host graph they they can't match to the same one um for reasons of this application that i don't want to necessarily go into right now yeah and then uh, you can uh, 
define ultimately uh, the entire transformation here in this worksheet uh, that transforms a prescription or a set of prescriptions to a graph. Uh, it's just uh, a closure function that executes all these transformations that we've defined earlier. And I skipped some of them and they're all in the, the reference at the end. <clears throat> and uh, what, what the rest, uh, what the, uh, what the end here uh, statement does is it just um, um, displays all the time points, a simple temporal network, because if we just defined a simple rule, it's a graph test, it just filters from the graph, the simple temporal network, which is all the time connected time points. And so then you can call a transform this prescription and you get your simple temporal network and I abbreviated it here to make it fit the slide. And then uh, uh, we've figured out, for example, that, oh, there is a problem still. And so we need to fix something because one of the time points here uh, should not be there. You know? So, and then, then we fixed it, but this is the notion of explorative um, development of a graph transformation specification for a particular application. And then you may think about, so how do I now figure out whether multiple prescriptions are in conflict while well, you transform many of them and then uh, use uh, uh, one of these algorithms like the Floyd Marshall all pairs shortest path algorithm to uh, see if the shortest path between these time points and the restrictions has a negative weight and then they're in conflict. But there are, there are other um, solutions there. And that we currently don't do with graph transformations, but we actually use um, the underlying Neo4j query language cipher for doing that computation. Um, so that's another benefit of you know having the graph database underneath because there's actually a lot of um, graph um, algorithms supported by that too. And that uh, uh, system is, is also available with Great Press if you just go to that uh, URL that the, the Neo4j um, browser provides you. So that after that little example of that worksheet, I just want to uh, comment a bit about the Great Press architecture, how it is currently, and um, that that may change a bit. Um, so Great Press is containerized or to actually say it's a, um, the easiest way of using GreatPress is to use a virtual machine um, vagrant uh, to install this. Uh, of course, can be installed just um, by yourself too, but then you have to install Neo4j and everything separately. The visualizations that you've seen of the graphs are generated right now by Graphis, so they're static. But there's also available in the Great Press um, Vagrant box this Neo4j browser that comes with the Neo4j database and screenshot here. So um, right now there's one graph per container. So if you have multiple worksheets, um, they all share that graph. So the graph right now is, if you will, like a um, global variable. For all these worksheets. So now for the rest of this um, talk, I want to just uh, highlight a couple of points about the grape language or grape closure interoperability. So calling these graph transformation rules returns true or false, but there's also a built-in matches, there are built-in operations to GrapeS. matches returns all matches of a query of a rule execution. So if you, for example, call this graph test find person, which just finds uh, uh, nodes of type person, and then uh, call matches, then you get a closure data structure that contains all the matches in the graph. Uh, and then you can view them as well. Or uh, you can also just view the first one using closure functional threading. Um, rules, of course, can be parameterized. So you can call, for example, this rule here, which has uh, uh, 
uh, essentially adds a parent to a person if that person doesn't already have two parents and if that uh, person that you want to add is not already a parent of this. So it has a bunch of negative application conditions and it's isomorphic matching. Um, but it's it's a parameterized, right? So you can uh, just uh, plug in uh, closures, um, variables as, as parameters or arguments. That's very simple. Um, so I mentioned that we have this notion of merged nodes. This is a convenience that we found convenient from some of the applications that we've worked on with GrayPress. Uh, we found that it makes the um, specifications more compact and easier to use. So ultimately a merged node is a, it's like a created node that's created only if it doesn't exist already. Um, so to some degree, I mean, you can of course do this with a, uh, a rule that has a negative application condition. Um, check whether that node is already there and um, only if it's not there, create it. But uh, the difference between a merged node rule and a rule that has a negative application condition is that, is that the, uh, the merged node rule always then returns true. It always works. Whereas the, the other one returns false if that node is already there. So it's we found it convenient for our code and for the applications to have that. It says somewhat of syntactic sugar. We have uh, optional nodes. So here's an example um, uh, of a rule, create contract. Uh, if you create a contract with, uh, let's say, uh, a person who is a minor who has also a parent, uh, that parent becomes party of that contract too. It's an optional um, node here. We have a, uh, yeah, as I said, a difference between SPO and uh, uh, DPO semantics can be specified under this theory tag here of the rule um, specification. So um, uh, if, if I wanted to, for example, delete a person here with the name flow, and uh, there's, as I said, uh, embedding context, maybe um, dangling edges that will be created with this rule, if it's uh, DPO semantics, then uh, that, that would fail. Um, because it deletes the, uh, uh, it violates um, the property of the graph. Um, with uh, SPO semantics, um, which is the default for the rules, uh, it would just delete all these dangling edges as well. Uh, nodes can also be parameters. Um, so, um, Here's an example of two rules here, create person. And let's say you want to create a person, you have another rule, mark the newest um, person. So you, you want to chain, for example, create person and then uh, create a, a pointer to that new object. You can pass on this graph object um, to this other rule by ID in Neo4j and in GradePress, all nodes have IDs. So OID is a built-in that gives you that ID. Path expressions, I mentioned them. Um, ultimately, that's inherited from Neo4j because Neo4j uh, supports path expressions. Um, these path expressions can traverse edges either in any direction, a forward or backward direction. And you can also specify minimum and maximum number of um, traversals over each particular label. Uh, so then uh, when it comes to schema constraints, we have well, the normal um, kind of uniqueness of attributes for nodes, also defining indexes, which is really more for speeding up um, the, um, the search in the graph. We have um, cardinality constraints for edges, for example, to one, as I said, on the two side of edges, it can um, only point, uh, at these types can only point to one particular node. Um, type constraints, for example, the source type of the uh, edge works for can only be person or animal. 
so, so, so here's a, I guess it's just an example how, now, how on the worksheet um, a violation would be reported. So here we have a, we call a rule replace person by machine, which would violate that um, works for um, constraint that it can only originate from a person or animal. So you get, uh, get that um, constraint violation reported here. Uh, then users can define uh, further schema constraints. In fact, um, um, the two one is actually the two one constraint that we've seen here is internally de defined just uh, as using the, the built-in declare violation. And simple constraints can be just defined by testing for unallowed conditions. And here the test is just another well, graph transformation rule, well, actually a graph test. So uh, a, a too many relationship, if you find that, uh, then it's a violation of the two to one. Mm -hmm. uh, so users can just add more constraints that way. Uh, some sometimes constraints cannot be defined in a sim simple um, graph tests. Um, then um, closure can can be used to uh, define these. So for example, the source types or target types constraint um, here, you don't really have to understand that closure code, but it, it uh, yeah, it's a closure in implementation ultimately of that constraint. So then we have uh, transactions, as I said, transactions with backtracking. So here we have a um, example of two rules, uh, one higher, uh, so higher uh, a, a uh, the employer hires a worker that that not or, that doesn't already work for that employer, and then promote um, uh, promotes one of the workers for the employer, but only if that worker doesn't also do some moonlighting and works for yet another employer. So, if you wanted to have uh, then a compound operation, hire a director that first hires somebody and then promotes, of course, then uh, you may want to do this in an all or nothing semantics in a transaction, right? And depending on not every worker that you hire here, that person may actually moonlight. So the transaction makes sure that it, with proper backtracking, that this actually works. And we can pass elements in transactions. That's a little, little clunky, actually. That's a mechanism that I want to uh, improve a bit, but yeah. It currently uses two built-in forms, bind and consult. So here we have um, two rules, and I only show the graphical representation now. Hire someone which um, hires a worker for an um, employer with a particular name, and then train a um, a worker. Uh, and uh, if we want to, and the the worker actually here. That that um, object, the graph node W is actually a parameter of the train rule. So we can pass uh, ultimately uh, the uh, the worker that we hired here into this by using two forms, um, bind and consult. So binding binds a particular node or graph object from the previous uh, rule application to um, a variable and consult consults that. Uh, then we have control structures in transactions. So for example, until uh, uh, means execute the body uh, of that until statement until a particular graph test succeeds. So again, with this backtracking search semantics. Uh, here's a simple example, but maybe we may not want to go in this uh, in the interest of time. Let's all just clip about this a bit. Uh, we have a non-deterministic choice in these transactions. Again, with example, but I think uh, I'll, I'll just uh, not go into this because the examples are a little contrived anyway. Uh, we have a, um, a negative application condition uh, in transactions avoid. We have attribute conditions and attribute assignments. So here, actually, I mean, so part of the uh, Graypress 
manual is this implementation of the fairy man wolf grape problem some people call it the, the cabbage problem but it's the grape problem <laughs> so you see uh, um you know the uh, if you will the, the search for that problem if you're familiar with that um all right so so then i think i'm fairly at the end of the, the one hour so i want to talk a little bit about uh, our experience and um the roadmap um that i have for great press at this moment so first of all i have to give it a scorecard and it needs to be good <laughs> uh, i think i mean our experience is, is great for um, prototyping and for um in particular and discussing um experimentations i mean it's inherits this idea of uh, computation notebook <clears throat> it has the persistence uh, and the transactions uh, that we want uh, it has uh, scalability it inherits that from neo4j um, tooling weight, I mean, the plus is a little bit overstated in the sense that, uh, well, you still have to have, right now it's not in the cloud yet, although we could put it in the cloud, but right now you still have to put Vagrant and uh, Hypervisor on your machine. Right now it's, you have to download that <clears throat> virtual box. Uh, but it's great uh, runtime interrupt because uh, any JVM language uh, can interface with it. Ultimately, all of these worksheets are valid closure files. They are just normal closure files and closure works with Java and any JVM language. And it has great integration with the software development lifecycle tools. So we're using it inside and outside the lab. Um, I have some, some students um, uh, who use it, but also uh, at least I know one company that uses it for um, for uh, defining um, assurance cases for software hazard analysis. Um, yeah, what we would like to do is to move it from Vagrant to Docker, which would be even faster and even, and then have it in the cloud so that people could just go to a site with their browsers and just use it there. Um, it would be great uh, to integrate a better browser. Graphis uh, is very static. Um, so Neo4j, for example, has a dynamic browser. You can click on these nodes and you can see, okay, what's related in the context of this node. You can um, explore the graph. So better integrate Neo4j browser or something like that tooling would be great to have. As I said, uh, now it becomes increasingly uh, more challenging, um, but adding static analysis tools, verification tools, uh, in particular with respect to Confluence, uh, would be great to do. So there's, um, there's a great talk about that here too. Um, I'd like to replace the depth first search, this backtracking based search, uh, potentially in a, with a breadth first search. So uh, um, doing this exploration, for example, right now when you do the ferryman problem, uh, those of you who've seen this, um, the ferryman has coins and the, the, the coins uh, is to, not let the ferryman uh, cross over empty all the time. Uh, if we do a breath first exploration, we could actually uh, solve this problem without the coins. But also um, there's just work by um, Aaron Rensing and others um, that have explored how uh, these, these parallel explorations, uh, we can use the, the graph um, isomorphism tests uh, with some clever hashing and so on, uh, on, on how to solve these problems better. Um, I'd like to make graphs explicit arguments of graph transformation rules so that uh, we can we can take graphs as arguments to these graph transformation rules and really create a functional graph um, database, a functional grape. Uh, that would be really my goal as well. <clears throat> and I'd like to make grape ref reflective. Uh, ultimately having uh, graph transformations working on graph transformation rules. Um, so it's kind of meta dynamic, meta grape dynamic, and, and that would be a really a good goal, I think. And uh, yeah, there, there, are other, there are many other small, small pieces, but those are the highlights for the roadmap. I also want to mention that there is related work 
with respect to executable research papers, uh, or in particular share project around um, Peter van Gorb that uh, has this um, idea that uh, um, research papers become executable if you have uh, experiments and prototypes in a virtual machine that's co-hosted with this. Certainly related to this because part of uh, what computation notebooks and gray press tries to do is to, to have these kind of executable documents, demonstrable documents. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening to me. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. So that's the picture of, of um, the university. Or what is that? Oh, yeah, that's the, the picture of the university. So we, yeah, okay. the, this is the the uh, circle drive, which ultimately oh, right. main main part of the university inside, but it's also uh, is outside okay. of it. Yeah, so it's walking distance from the water. Yeah, yeah. Very nice. That's what I'm missing here. I'm far away from the water in all directions. But anyway, um, yeah. Thanks for the good talk. So it was, was 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 really. I mean, I, I I've seen a bit of that already last time at, at ICGT, but it was still new. So, um, I had a question, but I think you par partly answered that already. So, um. When you talked about transactions, I wasn't sure whether it's uh, transactions just in the database sense or transactions in the sense of involving search for a successful um, execution of the transaction. Because, of course, because you're non-deterministic, uh, it may be that you choose the wrong, um, the wrong rules or the wrong matches at some point. And therefore, you fail the transaction. But then you go back and do the backtracking and search again for possible successful part, I mean, like, like it was done in, in, in progress. So that is your operational model. Is that, is that yeah, that's, right? that's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the latter, right. I mean, it, it is supported uh, our implementation of these backtracking like search transactions is supported by the Neo4j um, underlying, I mean, it makes it easier to implement that. Um, Oh really? So but there's yeah. native native support for for backtracking transactions in Neo4j? No, no. But I mean, we're piggybacking um, mm -hmm. on the on on their transaction model. I, I'd say it makes it a little bit easier. So we we are rolling back unsuccessful searches, so to say. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, from from Grape's perspective, Grape Press perspective, uh, it is this this notion of um, mm -hmm. yeah exploration, that first backtracking transactions. Yeah. Okay. Right. So if I understand correctly, what 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 Neo4j gives you is the transaction model and the backtracking, but not the no, 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 it does right, not, not really give you the backtracking. It gives you the transaction back. model. It gives you the, the rollback, yeah. but so not the backtracking. The backtracking needs to be put yeah, yeah. on top of that. Uh, Neo4j, yeah. unfortunately, has uh, just this classical um, asset transaction model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which is what you would expect, I suppose, for, mm. for, yeah. for a database. Isn't it? Okay, okay. Right. And what you said was that you wanted to, to um, sort of get away from the backtracking or at least offer an alternative by doing sort of um, breath first search or, or sort of ex exhaustive exploration, essentially. I mean, isn't that, I mean, aren't you doing model checking then, essentially, or, or at least state space generation, like, 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 like in, in, in roof? Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess it could be, it's the same kind of technique that's used in model checking, right? But yeah. um, I mean, this goes hand in hand. This this wish of mine goes hand in hand with also this notion of a functional grape where we you have actually graphs as first order objects that you plug into graph transformation rules. Because if you then have them as first order objects, you can you can compare the results. You can say, okay, well, the, these two uh, ultimately were not making progress. These these graphs are. Um, uh, um, there's isomorphic mappings between them. Uh, so we stop exploration here, we're going continuing exploration there and so on. Mm. Um, that goes hand in hand. Uh, mm. uh, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I see, for example, the uh, advantage of doing that. So right now, for example, it's, it's yeah, at the example of the, the ferryman problem right now, it, the ferryman, there is nothing to stop potentially the, the, the ferryman from, from making um, no progress and going back and forth a couple of times, empty-handed or empty-shipped or so. 
if we explore this in parallel, we just stop exploring in that direction because we say we've been there and then we go in, in other directions. So in, in this case, this breath first strategy would be better. Not sure if I want to com uh, completely um, replace depth first search with breath first search, but maybe offer alternatives there. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm well, why, so the reason why I'm sort of curious about this is because there is a, um, I think there's a question of what is the, the, the intended, um, I guess, application scenario, the, the intended use case you have in mind. Um, so I can see that for the kind of modeling examples like the ferryman, you know, mm -hmm. where you're creating a graph transformation model and you want to analyze that. And I'm, I'm, I mean, that's what I do most of the time. So I would be very sort of interested in that. Um, but if you have a, a regular model transformation uh, or, or basically something where you want to compute the function from A to B, uh, would, you, would you think of using search uh, either sort of back breath first or depth first in, in, in scenarios like this? Yeah, so no, but um, we also, I mean, I didn't really talk about an application like this, but um, in uh, health information systems, for example, uh, we often also have to align um, patient records that, that have been received from various um, uh, sources. So you could say, think about, uh, you know, uh, aligning these in, and right away comes to mind, maybe triple graph grammars and so on. But, mm -hmm. um, it's also these, these are also potentially search problems where where you do want to uh, um, look for the best alignment. Um, hmm. um, you can implement that in various ways, but um, you know that would be an example for for a search that you can implement as a search, right? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. If there's a if 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 if, if 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 the search is in the nature of the problem, I can I can. I can see that if it's if it's based if, if if it's just there because you you you're using a rule based approach that happens to be non deterministic but you actually want a, a, a particular result so let's say if it's the result of under specification that is probably wasteful isn't it but if it's in the, in the nature of the problem that there is more than one solution and you want to search for the best one let's say I can I can I can see that yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah that's right all right cool so. Um, I don't know if anyone else has a question. If not, I have another one um, because I, I'm interested in um, stochastic modeling and, and, and simulation. So, um, so seeing that you, I mean, again, this kind of ferryman example. I mean, it's not stochastic, but it's clearly a modeling example, not a, not a. Um, I don't know how how to call it. You're not implementing a tool there or a, or a, or a computation as such, but you're modeling. Uh, you're modeling a problem and then analyzing that. So, so um, could I use this uh, uh, or, or a similar kind of framework to to do stochastic simulations, for example? So, if I add rates to rules and if I put some some sort of infrastructure on top that that manages rule applications and 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 selects the right rules to apply based on I don't know Monte Carlo simulation algorithms and things like that. And that would be very, very interesting. Um, I, I, I see no reason why not. And I think that that will be very interesting. There are lots of applications like that as well, even also in the uh, healthcare field. Mm. Um, we've, we've done also applications, not with graph transformations, but uh, maybe I should have talked to you about this uh, <laughs> with your uh, uh, background in stochastic simulations, potentially in the graph transformation field. But um, yeah, um, applications that we've worked on uh, in the past is, uh, uh, for example, emergency room um, wait time optimization, which is a big okay, problem okay. at least in, in healthcare right now, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. So we we see uh, you know this notion of um, big wait times in our emergency rooms. And then the question was, okay, so what, what is the best bang for the back? Uh, should we invest in uh, a few more beds? Should we invest in a few more nurses where the bottlenecks? And then you, you do this kind of uh, simulation uh, looking at their typical arrival times and, and, mm -hmm. and, and you know, changing your system and see what, what is the outcome of this. Mm -hmm. um, it would be great to do that mm -hmm. with um, some notion of stochastic um, 
graph transformations. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, the main bottleneck there typically, or the bottle, the bottleneck. Yeah, but, but the, the, the main cost there is essentially that you need to have, um, you need to know all the matches for all the rules at each point because you basically need to choose one randomly. Um, mm -hmm. So, so, but if you have that anyway, uh, so if that is easy to do, I mean, it may be expensive, but if that is easy to do in principle. Um, then you're halfway there in terms of the actual functionality. And then all you need on top of that is the kind of simulation control that keeps track of the, uh, of the timing essentially and selects the rules, generates random numbers in order to choose rules and, 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 and execute them. So, mm -hmm. and that could probably just be a, a I mean, if, you, if you're able to program a, a rule application, so if you sort of write a control program on top of, of the rule applications that, 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 um, executes rules and that can also ask rules i mean give me all your matches and and um yeah as i said generate random numbers and execute rules it's, it's probably easy to just write that kind of simulation cycle on top of this in this um in this language um, um closure closure was the language wasn't it in which closure that's right yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, sort of the, the 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 higher level language that you embedded all yeah. this in um right so, yeah, and, and I, I think that uh, getting the matches should should be um, relatively easy and and uh, performant because I mean we benefit a lot from Neo4j's optimization and and I mean if you I mean, it becomes important of course to to define your indexes and uh, uh, and um, keys uniquenesses and so on because then the database. Uh, uh, creates these search structures um, mm -hmm. uh, to look these uh, nodes up, but Neo4j is very performant. I mean, ultimately, mm -hmm. I, as you can imagine, of course, if you if you do matches with this isomorphic uh, isomorphism uh, requirement, then that gets a little slower. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, yeah, but, uh, but a simulation is not necessary. The simulation, yeah, the simulation just basically uses the in-place transformation, so it doesn't. Yep. generate all the states it just generates yep. one state after the other so mm -hmm. so in that sense it may actually be more um scalable as i said except for the cost of the of finding all the matches but it doesn't use incremental pattern matching or anything like that i suppose uh, the, the the kind of mechanism that finds all the matches because that is what 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 um i mean people in in darmstadt do for example sebastian amos that we're working with on on his stochastic simulation tool, um, which is um, derived from Moflon or sort of embedded into uh, eMoflon. Um, so they basically have an incremental pattern matching engine that they use anyway for the for the model transformation for their triple graph grammar implementation. And that sort of maintains uh, basically the collection of all matches for all rules at all times anyway. So you get this kind of as a, as a, as a side effect almost. Well, mm -hmm. side effect. But as a, it's easy to basically do implement um, um, a stochastic simulation on top of that, or easier because it's it's the, 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 the it's, it's already in the basic matching mechanism. This 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 um, um, the the ability to generate all the matches. Right. Um, so, so so sorry. <laughs> so the question is, you you don't you. There's no incremental pattern matching in this particular case. It's just no. finding all the matches again and again. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, I think there was a question by Stefan. Uh, Stefan, do you want to unmute yourself and just? Uh... So Stefan is on YouTube. So so I pasted this over from the. Oh, chat I see. Okay. Okay. Right. So then. Uh, can you see the question? Uh, okay, I'll just open the chat. Uh, okay, uh, I mean, I can read it for you, but maybe easier for you if you can also see it. Uh, Mason driven applications. No, I have another question. Okay. Yeah, so, so Stefan, yeah, did I understand correctly that the notebook allows to blend in rule definitions with a typical closure code? So you could in theory, instrument a larger application with a notebook. Absolutely, yeah. So I didn't show this. You're, you're absolutely correct, yeah. So I didn't show how ultimately the worksheet would look when you just open it in a normal text editor. But it, yeah, it is normal closure code. So um, 
ultimately the markdown is just shown as markdown in a comment and um yeah and the generated image uh is also in the worksheet but it's in, um it's a it's a base 64 encoded it's some inlined image there uh which um, you can configure your editor just to show on a line or um i mean just ignore it yeah ultimately it, it is it is closure you can just um, work with it uh, with the worksheet and just work with a normal ide or a development environment and just um, integrate it with the rest of your code mm -hmm. okay um Constantine has a question yeah uh, Constantine, are you i mean you're, you're here with us on zoom isn't it so you could ask a question yourself if you wanted to Okay, so yeah, great press code to available say, but it's, download it's, somewhere. Yeah, uh, so found the great a one. simple question. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, download. Yeah, okay, so uh, we will, uh, I talked to Nick, uh, we'll add some links um, to the website on where it can be downloaded. I mean, they, um, yeah, so the source code and there's also um, a vagrant box that can be downloaded if you don't want to get going really fast. Mm -hmm. We'll put that on the uh, seminars website. Okay, thanks a lot. And and maybe your paper also, please. And the paper, yeah. So preprint of the paper, yeah. Okay, or or have to, yeah. See how what the copyright, yeah. Thank you. And uh, maybe, maybe as a follow up, Jens, um, I, I think what would be mm -hmm. nice at some point we could maybe invite you again for more of a workshop session where you uh, show us a bit the code in action. You think that. Might be possible. Cool. Show us the code in action. Yeah, if, if it, it gets really <laughs> I mean, like the, 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 the yeah. Wolframesque uh, <laughs> performance <laughs> you alluded to before. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm still at home right now. But, uh, yeah. I mean, and oh, sorry, I it's uh, at home. It's I, I should get it. I should get it on this running on this machine too. Yeah. No, but uh, more seriously, I mean, thanks a lot. It was a very interesting talk. And um, I should maybe say that um, we have a few people also in this new Greater Exact team who have experience with interface design. Uh, for example, Emilio, who, who, who unfortunately just had to leave already, um, he designed James well, I, uh, Yeah, and I still here, Nick. Yeah, yeah, well, well, I was the same, but I'm trying to follow you. Yeah, but uh, I will have to leave uh, the moment my other meeting starts. But yeah, sorry. I'm yeah, maybe uh, because I was just mentioning that uh, Emilio, you designed this JS Cork uh, interface, for example, which is an online interface which runs directly in the web browser, which is, of course, maybe the, the best possible scenario for portability. Um, and then there is this Quiver app, which, which you can use to graphically input, uh, you know, code, which then you could do for the rules. So I have a feeling this could be an extremely interesting platform also for maybe a sort of the key, it's an easy, easy entry point for doing graph transformation theory indeed. So one could maybe think about designing a tutorial in graph transformation theory using, using your tool. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you have maybe some, some quick comment on, on JS Cock, just, just to explain the experience. Yeah, no, it's very interesting. I have no comment. I think I love to see this because actually the style, uh, like uh, yes, uh, yes, cook is more like for writing books. So the style is very different. So notebooks are very interesting to me. I think I'm more convinced it's an open question because it's more like uh, uh, proof documents are more like LaTeX document. Are more like if you are writing an overlay, if you are section, theorem, lemma. So yeah, I don't know. I don't have any comment. This is very cool. And uh, many people, but many people is asking this question. The students come like in the scope rooms, they say, oh, like this kind of notebooks, how they're related to the way uh, or these other documents are, uh, you could think the same. So this is a very interesting question, Nick. Uh, I don't know, uh, I don't have any comment. Or there myself, I'm learning about this. Is I'm not very familiar with computational notebooks. I find that very, very interesting. And indeed, there is a point uh, they should combine, uh, but uh, I don't know how. Yet to... yeah, and sorry, uh, just one more, if I may, one more comment. Because um, what we are trying to do with this greater exact project is to, to bring Cog functionality into graph transformation theory, maybe even formalizing it in Cog, that is the ultimate idea. So, I mean, maybe there could be some nice interaction in terms of your static analysis. Um, so, I, I think we would very much like to invite you again for some more workgroup style meeting, if that's possible. 
that, that would be very, very welcome. Yeah, I mean, Excellent. Uh, Nick, I mean, we, you and I, we, we chatted uh, earlier. Uh, uh, I, I think that would be great. Because, um, I mean, um, very synergetic relationship <laughs> there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, now that you mentioned, Nick, one of the reasons we're pushing a bit more this uh, GS Coke approach is actually because this is the way we have found uh, we can integrate uh, with other tools, uh, with other ecosystems. So, okay, once you have a reasonable web platform, like for example, Coke, if you are not in that, you are in OCaml, and you know this is this starts to be, or Isabel uses some things, they tend to be very close systems. So actually, I think indeed uh, one of the reasons is uh, as long as you can make uh, something like is uh, running like in the browser, then it turns out you can really make the things communicate uh, with the modern browsers. Well, the way we do is we put uh, a worker, a web worker for every process and they have to send messages. But uh, I mean, it's work. So for example, yeah, I don't know, but uh, but uh, it will be really nice to try to integrate. Uh, because I can tell you like for this kind of things, uh, computation, this kind of computations, their improvements are not going to be good. Uh, they are very behind, in my opinion. On the other hand, we have the technology to integrate that. So you can have uh, simultaneously the notebook and your theorem prover. And you can delegate to every of the tool uh, the, what they do the best. So, but yeah, this, as I say, is just a still a very preliminary uh, uh, idea, in my opinion. Yeah, but that, that's very promising. I'd love to join work, work meetings on that. Fantastic. Okay, excellent. And yeah, I, I, I'll be quite interested to, to, to maybe explore this idea of stochastic simulation. Um, Me too. <laughs> because I, I, I mean, we have tools to do stochastic simulation, so it's not that that, that, that is impossible. But uh, it's essentially for the reason you mentioned, so, so having something interactive that is that one can share, that one can use to easily discuss with people and so on. I think it's a major um, it's a major benefit, yeah. And there are stochastic simulation uh, libraries, for example, in, in in Python, which work very well in Jupyter notebooks, where you 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 program your simulation and it immediately generates you a graph with all the statistics and so on, which is very beautiful. Mm -hmm. yeah? So so it's it's a, it's a, fits very well because simulations are often a bit experimental. As you can imagine, so you, you play with the parameters, and then you want to see what comes out, and that I think is very well supported in this kind of format, in principle. Yeah. All right. So, um, unless there are other questions, which I don't think there are at the moment, uh, at least I can't see any. Um, I would maybe close the official part here, um, and so that means we disconnect from the YouTube channel. But before doing that, thanks again, Jens, for getting up early and then giving us this nice talk and. Thanks for everyone to everyone else for for attending. Um, and I don't know, uh, Nick, do you want to advertise the next uh, session in, in yes. a couple of weeks? Or? So, so it's actually next week. So, oh, next. Um, if you count, uh, I mean, we have uh, we now have a rhythm where every second week we mm -hmm. have a working mm -hmm. group, and uh, the idea is that we get a little bit more into touch with this core community. Especially next week, I can advertise we have a talk by Cyril Cohen which is on Hierarchy Builder, which is one of the latest features. Uh, well, it's very active research in, in Cork. And uh, then the week after, we have a talk by Daniel Struber, who is one of the uh, ICGT co-chairs in next year, uh, together with me. <laughs> uh, and uh, yes, so I mean, thanks a lot, Jens. That, that was fantastic. And we very much hope to be able to invite you again. I saw already in the comment, there was quite a few people who would be interested in a practical workshop on, on Redpress. So maybe we can organize a session and yes. And sorry, if there's anybody still on YouTube and wishing to join us for a chat, we, I think we still stay for a bit longer and you can just join us via the link, which is provided on the YouTube channel. Mm. So thanks again.